moving on to another one of our first year residents. Uh, Chris Ricks is going to talk to us about the phenotypes of uh, AMD in Ghana, uh, which is a place uh, near and dear to some of us here. Spent a bit of time there, and uh, we're anxious to hear what you have to say. Thank you. My name is Christopher Ricks. Like Dr. Hoffman mentioned, I'm one of the first year residents. Uh, so I recently was able to go to Ghana with Dr. Hageman and the Still Center for Translational Medicine to study macular degeneration in West Africa. And you know, this uh, doesn't just apply to the genotypes and phenotypes of AMD in West Africa. It applies to really all forms of AMD. Uh, it's been alluded to several times already today, uh, some of the genetics that have come out with AMD and the big changes that we've discovered in the past decade or so. So we all know what macular degeneration is, don't need to go into details there. Uh, a lot of people have these very differing phenotypes and raises the question, why are they so different? What are we really seeing? So one of the big things that's changed in the last decade is understanding what genes are associated with AMD. It turns out that chromosome 1 and chromosome 10 uh, contribute a vast majority of the genetic risk factors to macular degeneration. There's several others, you can see there at the bottom here, that also associate with it, but uh, studies have shown that it's less than five, about 5% 5 of AMD is attributed to those other cases and 90 to 95 are associated with either chromosome 1 or chromosome 10. So that gives us something we can really look at, really study, and really try to make a difference in. So chromosome 1 is the main focus of this study, although I will touch briefly on chromosome 10. It's a very complex focus. Uh, there's six main haplotypes we look at. Two confirm major risk, two confirm major protective factors, and then two are sort of neutral. So these SNPs associated with the protective haplotypes are the ones that are most associated and uh, is significant in chromosome 1 variants of AMD. So why Ghana? So in a couple reasons. Uh, one, we have a, one of the doctors we worked with, uh, who we'll talk about later on. He is uh, from Ghana originally. He's now in the UK. And he was able to set up a lot of the connections for us. But really, it comes down to the genetics. And we'll probably see this in a broader West African population as well. But in chromosome 1 frequency, with just pure chromosome 1, we see in about 11% of Caucasians and about 9% of Ghanaians, we think. There's not great population studies. Uh, whereas in chromosome 10, we see in about only 1% of the Ghanaian population. And then this is the big factor here. Almost 45% of all the chromosomes studied in the Ghanaian population have this protective uh, alleles that make it so AMD is very, very rare in the West African and probably the broader African population as well. So this gives us the opportunity to use an experiment of nature uh, to really look at the difference between these pure chromosome 1 AMDs and then uh, another aspect of this study that's ongoing is in the Asian population you get almost pure chromosome 10 association. So we can really look at the two and say what's different, what's the same, and how are these two diseases really playing out uh, in, in the rest of the population, particularly Caucasians where we see a huge mixed uh, genotype with 1 and 10. There's also a lot of evidence that they don't interact with each other and that they are two very, very different diseases. So this gives us the current problem with any attempts at treatment. If you don't know what you're treating, uh, you don't know if you're going to get any good results. So if you try to treat uh, AMD and it's really you're treating one, but someone has one and ten risk factors, you're not going to get much benefit. They're not going to get better. The, the treatment will fail, even if it did affect the chromosome one risk. So that makes it crucial to find out how these are different and how to treat them separately. So that way when you, down the road, we can treat them both together. So a couple of the main differences, chromosome one, directed AMD, you see a lot of these PEDs, you see a lot of drusen, whereas chromosome 10, you don't really see the PEDs, you don't see the drusen. You see this chronic, this progressive atrophy. So that takes us to Ghana. While we were there a month ago, we saw 218 patients over the course of the week, which uh, adds up to, there's more than 800 patients that have been examined over the past years on uh, previous trips with Dr. Vitale, Dr. Bernstein, been involved in this uh, for a long time now. We did clinical examinations, macro CTs, fundus photos, and drew blood samples and spun out the DNA in a lab there with some of the staff from the Still Center for Translational Medicine. So now I want to show some of the unique phenotypes that we saw there and uh, some of the thoughts that we've had about these. Uh, a lot of this is preliminary, but uh, you can see we did see some of the more classic macular drusen that we're used to seeing here. But if you'll notice, this fundus is very light. Uh, we don't see a, a huge population of African Americans or Africans in general here in Utah, but uh, this is a very light fundus compared to some of the fundi we saw. We would see geographic atrophy, which is actually quite rare there, as well as CNV, 
which is also quite rare. This is the same patient, one, had, one I had had a, a lens exchange, the other had not. And then we saw what we called uh, this colloidal drusen, these really big, soft looking, chunky drusen that uh, when we would see this, it was almost always associated with pure chromosome one risk and uh, you know, homozygous. Homozygous, yeah. With zero chromosome 10 risk. So you can see this chart uh, just briefly shows some of the different alleles we looked at and the hugely associated chromosome 1 deficiencies versus the chromosome 10 is not associated hardly at all with the uh, AMD and Ghanaians. So we also saw a lot of really unique dystrophies uh, that weren't really associated with any of the known AMD genes. So this is a just, you know, we did see a few pseudodrusen, very, very rare though. Uh, one thing we saw in probably 50% of the patients we saw, whether they were known uh, AMD patients or just our controls, we'd see this peripheral cuticular drusen, we called it, or PCD, this really fine drusenoid looking appearance of, of material that uh, on genetic analysis over the past decade of looking at these patients has almost no association with chromosome 1 or 10. We'd also see what we term this cauliflower drusen, uh, where it's just these big, beefy, unique looking almost CNV-like, but uh, kind of interesting phenotype. Again, not associated at all with any of the chromosomes we know affecting AMD. Then we see that we call this green dystrophy. Uh, we saw this in not a small number of patients uh, of the 200 we saw. Just this green looking appearance that uh, doesn't associate with any of the AMD factors again. And then this is something that we may have read about. I think it covers about two lines in our BCSC clinical series. Mm -hmm. uh, this West African crystalline drus dystrophy. It's very unique green crystals right in the macula. Uh, it used to be said that maybe it's associated with cola seed or cola nut in, in the diet, but a lot of the docs we worked with out there, they said that's, you know, no one eats that stuff, maybe out in the bush, but not the general population. They think that's, that's bunk. Um, but there's not a lot of research, we don't know. So this leaves us with some burning questions. AMD is so rare in Africans, so is what we're seeing really uh, AMD? And if it is, is it from the European influence? There's been four or five hundred years now where uh, Ghana has been either ruled or visited very frequently by Europeans. Uh, and so some of these patients with lighter fundi, is this some uh, European genetics getting mixed in there? Possibly a little bit of chromosome 10, because we do see it very rarely. Next question, why is chromosome one associated protection so high in Africans? Uh, even if you have the risk factor uh, alleles, if you have even one protection allele, you don't get it, you just don't. And why is that so high in Africans? Uh, we've mentioned earlier maybe the theory of uh, these genetics adding some sort of uh, immunological factors. Uh, you talked about the Europeans getting wiped out every couple hundred years and the people that survived Maybe this helps uh, keep us alive. And then what causes this green dystrophy, these cauliflower dystrophies in some of the West African crystalline dystrophy? Uh, this all is going to take more study and more research. So next steps are going to be to continue studying these genotypes and phenotypes associations to really understand the differences in the process that, uh, goes, that goes into play when uh, macular degeneration does manifest itself. Um, really trying to work to understand the differences in chromosome 1 and chromosome 10. And currently, Dr. Hageman and his group at the Still Center for Translational Medicine are preparing for clinical trials of a gene modulating therapy that targets chromosome 1, which is really exciting. Uh, it shows a lot of promise, and uh, if that works for one, then that could treat a large section of the population with AMD, and the next step would be to work on chromosome 10. And then down the road, you know, we could realistically see a cure for macular degeneration. And then further research into these unique dystrophies with no known cause. So I want to give a huge thanks to Dr. Hageman and the SCTM staff. They did a lot of work on this trip and uh, were kind enough to let me join them. Uh, some of the other doctors from around the world we worked with, Dr. Julie Silvestri from Belfast, Dr. Winifred Amawako in Nottingham, and then the two local doctors we worked with a lot, Dr. Stephen Akafo and Dr. Kwesi Amisi Arthur, and then the entire 2017 Ghana team. Any questions before I move on to my quality improvement project? Yes. So, you know, fascinating these differences. And and, and the most fascinating group that, that they've looked at was Easter Island. Have you heard about this? Yeah. Uh, they essentially looked at the entire population of native uh, Rapa Nui of Easter Island and there was zero macular degeneration. Zero. And uh, they did not have risk of chromosome 10 or 1. And a lot of them had protective 
uh, it's considered a group that moved from uh, Africa very, very early on. And so if you think again about the hypothesis that there is a difference in association with an increased risk of infection uh, for the uh, protective type, because what, what this does is, is that this is a regulator gene, and the protective really is effective in turning off the complement system. And when you have a defect, your complement system is always revving, always going. So it's, I just think it's the northern crowding that when you're protective, you just had a slightly decreased risk and over a period of multiple generations. Whereas in Africa, uh, infectious disease was an issue, but never that huge acute crowding concern that they had. And therefore, there was just not that acute change in, in, and that's the differences between those two different populations. There's one other theory that's pretty fascinating and uh, uh, that is, is that uh, we picked up in particular a fair amount of the risk gene from Neanderthal. It's really interesting that, uh, that there may be some aspect of that, uh, and, and uh, you know, obviously that's something that's more of a Northern European and Asian than it is in regards to African. But, but I think the infectious disease hypothesis, uh, as far as the treatment, it's, just, it's really exciting that gene therapy has been put together. I think there's a really good understanding of, of what it is and is needed in chromosome one to provide the protection, and um, you know, we're going to be working with the people in London and. Uh, it's <clears throat> move as rapidly as possible into treatment. And uh, you know, the, the, the hope indeed is you can produce a protective. And uh, uh, a lot of questions. I mean, is this going to work on advanced disease? Probably not. That, but can you prevent it early on? You know, I think, I think that there's a very real possibility. Dr. Wilson, uh, did they ever check for the vitamin D levels for this population? Check for? Vitamin D. So uh, we do know from the work of Meg D'Angelis and several others that uh, there is an increased risk of progression on the nurture side if your vitamin D levels are low. Yeah. But the overall impact of vitamin D in regulus in comparison to the genetic is quite small. It's not unimportant, but it's, it's pretty it's small. Good. Enough that even several studies since have not shown vitamin D to be important in regards to this. I, I think in this particular case, this effect we're seeing is overwhelmingly genetic and not nurture. Yeah, because I, I've seen some studies in India where the level of vitamin D uh, is very, very low, and that's the reason AMD is on a rise in that area. No question that vitamin D uh, does increase the risk, but, but in regards to the genetic aspect, you know, it, it would appear to me that it's much smaller. Uh, I mean, I, I, I think that you can see that, that largely what we're seeing here is, is the genetic. Nurture is not unimportant, but it's, it's, a, it's a relatively small effect. All right, now let's briefly touch on my quality improvement project. So uh, I was tasked and undertook the, the, the recreation of the residence schedule this year. So we, this was driven by the uh, addition of a fourth residence. I want to thank Lee for joining us and causing this to happen. Uh, so our goal of the project was to create a schedule that maximizes education, training, experience while balancing all the needs of the different, uh, the Moran, the VA, and the university. So we want to measure this by uh, self-perceived preparedness for fellowship and and practice, resident wellness, as well as faculty evaluation of residency, uh, resident competency. So you can see some of the changes <laughs> that are coming into play here. Uh, there's obviously a lot to look at, a lot of time spent fiddling with the, the colors, that's probably the most important part. Um, <laughs> some of the big highlights, so we're gonna have dedicated consult months now, whereas before we had to try to balance clinical time with consults, uh, early pathology lab exposure, dedicated uveitis time, uh, continuity and oculoplastics training, early neuro-ophthalmology exposure, dedicated cornea rotations, um, earlier cataract training, more clinical and surgical flexibility at the VA as well as more residents at the VA, which is going to be a huge help, uh, dedicated glaucoma surgical training, some ac academic time, and then three months of elective time. Uh, and so part two of this project was validating the increase in elective time. Uh, briefly went over some of the things we, a lot of the alumni maybe received a survey from Dr. Petty asking what did you do with your elective time, how did it help, what would you have changed. Uh, all the things that we do with it here, international work, research, uh, boosting areas of deficiency, and then preparing for fellowships. And you can see all the places we've gone all over the world and uh, how we rank as far as our perceived preparedness versus the average perceived preparedness. Uh, about a 10% self-perceived increase of preparedness from our. So if you have more questions, the poster's out in the lobby. Uh, thanks, Dr. Petty and all the alumni that helped with that. Thank you. <laughs>